going on, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Nick Bartell, Editor-in-Chief for Techno Warriors TV, and welcome back to another Alien Abductee interview, or Alien Abduction interview. I'm the Editor-in-Chief for Techno Warriors TV, and we are back with another interview about alien abductions, UFOs, and all that stuff. I have someone special on the show for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one of the big kahunas. I'd say probably just as big as John Ventry's, inter uh, just big as John Ventry. We have a Hollywood actress on the show for you today. Uh, we have um, Camille James Harmon. She is an actor and partner at the Conjunction, uh, at Conjunction LLC, UFO Experiencer. She has been awarded in playing Mary Matillion in Oscar-winning film Vice, as seen in Shameless, The Lifetime Movie, A Daughter is Desiria, and all a bunch of shorts and commercials. She's also a um, former editor at UFO Magazine from 2004 to, uh, from 2000 to 2004, and also a UFO Experiencer. Now, she is also a project on a brand new project with a large UFO organization, which is has MUFON members, like big MUFON members. We're talking Jesse Peak. Uh, we're talking um, uh, like like Jesse Peak, uh, uh, Gray Anderson. Tell we ha what's the name of that organization besides MUFON? Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. So yes, she's uh, one of the founders of Hollywood. Disclosure Alliance, and this is where you get these big, huge Hollywood stars and, and various other people talking about UFOs, abductions, ETs, UAPs coming all together as one group. We have someone huge on the show for us today talking about their UFO sightings and abduction, uh, their alien abduction they had. I also want to give a big shout out, shoot out, shout out to Gray Anderson, the uh, California State, Southern California State Director for MUFON. I want to give out a big shout out to Jesse Peak. His interview just passed ten thousand views, and it's almost sub. I just think it's about to hit eleven k views. Holy snarks! That is a lot of views. MUFON is on top of their game. And I want to actually look this up real quick. All right, hold on one second. I'm going to search up the MUFON director. Sorry if it's you can hear that little voice. It's me typing. Okay. I want to give a big awesome shout out to everyone, including Brian Lindley, the state director for the Utah chapter for the Mutual UFO Network. We were gonna have him on the show, but my in, by but but my work and my health issues kept getting in the way of that. Move on, executive director. Here is information. So let me just look up the move on executive director because I want to give him a big shout out. David McDonald. I want to give you a big heavy metal shout out. David McDonald is the new head honcho of the Mutual UFO Network. Now, it used to be Jan Harzan, but sadly, he went sour and rotten to the core. But guess what? MUFON is still strong. They are just as strong as me. They don't let anything stop them. That's how good Dave McDonald is. Dave McDonald, I want to give a big, amazing MUFON shout out to you. I can't wait to have you on our show. It'd be awesome to have the executive director for the Mutual UFO Network. 
Now, John Ventry was going to be the going to be the head of MUFON, but but unfortunately he you know didn't win the he didn't win to be the director, but he is still amazing. He is the host of Hangar One on MUFON, and he's been on Anderson Cooper. He's a multi-state, he was a multi-state MUFON director. He was on the board of directors for MUFON, and he was this close to becoming the executive director for MUFON. That's right, had he won, I would have interviewed the executive director for the Mutual UFO Network. But if you can take a look at this, um, Dave McDonald, I can't wait to have you on our show. I'd love to have the executive director for MUFON. It'd be so awesome to have you on our show. That one would be another record buster. I can't believe that Jesse Peake's audio interview blasted almost 11,000 views. He's sitting at 1,300 likes right now. That is currently the most liked video on our channel, or almost. Uh, there is a, there's a couple of I think there's a video review that has more, but not for long. I can see him going to 2K likes. But ladies and gentlemen, it's just amazing because I woke up to this. I can't believe how much of report we're getting from the UFO, ET, MUFON community is absolutely amazing. I can't wait for more interviews. I am so excited to have, um, what's your name? Camille James Harmon. Cam Camille James Harmon. Well, Camille, on our show, oh my God, this is so awesome to have a Hollywood actress Big time actress on our show today. This is huge. So if thank you, ever, you, Nick. If you ever watched Vice or Shameless, you know her. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to shut my trap and it is time to begin the abduction and you will the alien abduction and UFO sightings of Camille James. Harmon, tell us about what happened and take it away. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me. So, yes, I have recently returned to the UFO world back in, I guess, a year or so ago. Um, I had dropped out for like nine years, actually. But previous to that, I was very active. And it all began for me in 1995. I was living in Los Angeles. I had just moved from New Orleans with my boyfriend at the time. We were both actors, and we wanted to go from a smaller market to a bigger market. I had my master's degree from the University of New Orleans. I felt like hot stuff. We had just done a production of Richard III in New Orleans, and he played Richard, and I played Lady Anne. And we just thought, you know, it's time to go to L.A. and see what happens. So I got here. Um, I had recently read Whitley Strieber's book, Breakthrough, uh, right before moving to LA like in August of 1995 and was very moved by that book I had felt compelled to purchase that book at the bookstore it was a hardcover and it was expensive and it was like staring at me that alien face and I was like oh my god what's up with this book I have to have it so that was kind of my wake up to the to the information that book but then shortly after that things started happening for me so that book was like a gateway or a you know I don't know what it was. It activated my experience for sure. So we get to LA and um, everything's going great. Like we had jobs, we had you know an agent. I, I was SAG. I had I had all my ducks lined up for my career, right? Uh -huh. And and yet I started having all this weird anxiety and all these weird physical symptoms start to hit me as soon as we moved to LA, where I felt like not myself. I had anxiety. I had all these strange symptoms that were similar to pregnancy symptoms and I had no menstrual cycle for like months and it was very strange I was like I wonder if I'm pregnant but I didn't I didn't like just go to the drugstore and get a pregnancy test which is very unusual because you know if I'd ever was curious like that before I would just go get a stupid test and get it over <laughs> with and no right and I had never been pregnant before but I had been late you know before so mm -hmm. Um, anyway, in December of 95, just a few months after moving there, um, we were walking our dog, Opal, in Silver Lake, where we lived. It's a really hilly, really pretty neighborhood in Los Angeles. And um, she started, our dog started barking at this tree with uh, squirrels running up in it. And 
it was a palm tree with a bunch of squirrels at the top running around, and she was going crazy, and we were laughing, and we were looking up at the palm tree, and we saw this this UFO up in the sky, like right over, not right over the palm tree. It was really, really high, but we had the palm tree as a reference, you know, to see if this thing was moving, and it wasn't. It was just sitting there. It was really high, and it was black, and I, I don't really know the shape of it. I think it was a triangle, but it had like a, it was very tiny, and it had like a plasma edge around it so it was kind of hard to make out you know and um and he knew i had been reading that book you know and i was interested in ufos and he said oh oh my god it's a ufo you know (laughs) and uh, and i was like shut up and then we looked back because we we made eye contact and then we looked back up there and it was gone and that's when i went oh my god that was a ufo (laughs) and I, i remember handing him the leash to the dog and I said, I'm going home to report it right now. So I ran home. And I, there was a number in the phone book, like a, like, like a UFO hotline number. And it was MUFON. And I called it. And I said, I want to report a UFO. I'm in Los Angeles. And so this guy named Bill, he started to take my report. And, I, I, you know, to be honest, I don't remember how far we got with that report part. But he said, we have these monthly meetings if you want to come. And he told me where they were. And I was like, oh, I am there. That sounds so fun. So I started going to the MUFON meetings in like January or Feb- whenever they had the next one. I guess it was January of 1996. And at the same time in December of 95, um, I had this very strange attack <coughs> in my bed of sleep paralysis, which is very common for abductees, right? And mm-hmm. I had had that happen before in my life, but this particular time it happened, it happened um, it happened twice in one night. Once when I was in the bed alone and Eric was watching a movie in the living room. And I I heard, the weird thing about it was I heard a voice call my name. Like a mechanical sounding voice. Like right next to my head. Like kind of like an name. AI voice? Yes. Like I always say now looking back, it sounded like um, the Beastie Boys intergalactic. Like that voice. I know it sounds really corny, but that song came out after that happened to me. But when I hear that song, I think of it. Um, I know that Jack Sarfati also had an electronic voice talk to him in a phone call. That was a very mysterious thing. You can look that up about him. He's the physicist. Um, So that is a thing I've learned over the years. But it was very shocking to me. And I also saw an image of a gun in my face, which was very frightening because I'd never... Like what, before when I'd had sleep paralysis, I, I had never heard anything or seen anything. That was like really weird, right? I mm-hmm. mean, that's not normal. And I have never had that happen before or since where I've had sleep paralysis with any kind of audio or visual image. Just so you know, that happened one time in, in uh, December 1995. Anyway, so... Uh, and then it happened again later when Eric was in the bed with me and... And I remember you know, when I came out of it, I was like moaning because you kind of break out of it in different ways. And, and vocally, I had started like moaning, like, you know, and it woke him up <laughs> and he was like, are you OK? It's like, oh, my God, I was crying. And so anyway, um, I went to a move on meeting and I heard Kim Carlsberg speak. And she had a book out that was very interesting called Beyond My Wildest Dreams, I think it is. And um she had presented her book with Daryl Anka, who channels Bashar, Daryl Anka, the channel, and he had done the illustrations for her book. So it was like a team effort, her book. And I remember listening to her story, her, her, her whole presentation, and just getting more and more, like, terrified that I, I was like, oh, my God, I think I'm one of these people. I don't know. You just have this knowing it was really weird. And so I went to the back of the room at the end, and she had her books for sale. And I was flipping through her book, and it had a checklist in the back, like, signs you were abducted, you know. And I'm looking at all these things, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I have, like... All the signs. Like every, every single check. Every, yeah, every check box is... Every yeah, little thing is like, checked. I was like, I have a lot of these. Um, and I was really... I was, sh- like, shaky. And I was introduced to Barbara Lamb, the hypnotherapist, at that meeting. And I just, you know, I went to her and I said, I think I'm one of these people. 
and I want to work with you to, to do a regression, I guess, to this night in December when I had this, you know, attack and I heard this voice and the whole thing. And um, also because I had no period for like three months. And then in January, it came back after that event. In Did the you ever experience missing time during those months? Not that I know of. I just had a lot of anxiety and um, other symptoms. I had like sore breasts and heartburn. And like later on when I became pregnant with my son, like in 2001, and my, my pregnancy symptoms, that was my first pregnancy that I was sure was a human pregnancy, okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and the symptoms were so similar to what I had back in 95. It really freaked me out. I actually had to contact John Mack. I knew him. And I asked him, I said, I'm so freaked out about being pregnant. And, like, do you have any people on your list that are abductees that have had an alien thing and then like a an human a- yeah, like a, like an alien, like an alien hybrid type of thing. Right, like just like can I just talk to some woman who has has had both situations? Because I'm having, uh, I'm like having all this fear that my pregnancy that I have now is like, it's activating the memory of the other one, and it's also made. I had these very weird fears, like, is this pregnancy gonna disappear? You know, like I had uh-huh. to get past past that mark where I was deep into it and I was showing and I had the bump and the whole thing to really relax into it because it was like you know I had a cellular memory or something I don't know how to explain it it's so weird it's so embarrassing to talk about because I know people that are into UFOs have heard <coughs> have heard all this before about these these weird pregnancies but you know for new people it's I know it sounds crazy I don't know what to say about that other than that there's so many of us who've had this experience there's something going on now I will say I will say I want to say this from the outset I am very on the fence about this whole thing, okay? I have not made up my mind that it's aliens. It could very well be some kind of a secret, you know, human program with <clears throat> people projecting the image of aliens, tricking us, mind control, some kind of simulation. I don't know if these are interdimensional beings that live alongside us here on Earth. I don't know if they're from other planets. I am really on the fence. I don't know if they're demonic. I don't know what's going on. I am very open-minded, and I have not up, made up my mind. And so I just want to say that because, you know, a lot of people choose a side, and they get really, you know, sure about what they believe. I am not one of those people. I change my mind constantly. I actually do. So, sorry. Anyway, back to the story. So um, I did a regression with Barbara, and I got this full-on alien abduction memory, right, where I was hit with a blue beam of light in my bed. Uh, it was a very solid light, like a column of light. Kind of like what you see in uh, kind of what you see in like our picture there. Well, I'm looking at the picture, and to be honest, it's more solid than that. And there's no, there's no like flare. Like, does that make sense? Yeah. It's more like a, like a tube of light than a and a flare spot like a spotlight or something like you would see on a stage. Um, it was blue, and the blue color to me was a slight turquoise. Okay, so when this light hit me, I, I, in this memory, because I've had other memories with other things, but anyway, in this memory, it curled me into a fetal position, like a ball, like I curled into a ball. In this, that's my perception of it, mm-hmm. and I went up, up, up through the ceiling, and I was panicking, obviously, in the regression, and. Um, Next thing I knew, I have no memory of entering a spaceship, of seeing a spaceship, okay? So I just remember being in this light, going up, and I remember being unfolded and flat on a table of some some kind. Okay. And I was and I was terrified, and I didn't want to look around. And I was saying, th- and it was misty and white, like misty and white. And I was saying, everybody's looking at me, everybody's looking at me. And I was crying, and my teeth were chattering, and I was freaking out. And she's like, who's looking at you? And I'm like... I don't know. And she's like, well, she had to really talk me through the fear, right? <laughs> so she's like, look around and see what you see. So so I look over here in my memory, and I see this row of, of beings, these white beings that had, like, here, I have a little drawing. I know I sent you some photos, but I have some other things that I didn't send you. So, like, they look like this, kind of. And they had... Um, 
that helpful? Uh, Maybe it's not. Screen, yeah, there we go. Then. There we go. There we go. Okay. They had um, white robes on with with a high collar, and they had they were white and shimmery, and they had um, black eyes, and they had some kind of a, a circle triangle thing going on, pendant or something at their chest area. That was like a great. So you had an you were abducted by greys. Those look like greys. I would say that, yeah. But they um, they were not gray. They were white, luminous. Uh -huh. That's how I perceive them. So kind of like white a form of greys. Like a form of greys wearing white robes with high collars. And they mm -hmm. were very thin, and to me they were tall and thin. How tall um, do you think they were? I don't know. I wouldn't say super tall, but like not three feet tall. Like like at least five feet tall like me but thin very thin that's how I perceive them so anyway then I had this memory of some being that I could not see I was blocked from seeing this being but I had this whole thing where my my knees were opening and I was screaming like no one's touching my knees and my knees are opening it was really scary and they were telling me relax 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 telepathically and then they said you have a baby and we want it and I was like you know screaming so they so basically they, they were wanting to deliver an alien hybrid almost i don't know here let me finish the story so so anyway so I, then i saw a flash of this instrument it was like a gynecological instrument and um that frightened me and then all i know is i had the sensation that very quickly that was inserted into me and they took it out and there was something little and small in it that was pink ish and they and the, the one that was doing the procedure that I could not see like walked out of the room with it in that in that tool okay and I remember crying and just I felt so bereft and I was just crying and saying they didn't even let me see it you know I, I had this, this horrible grief right mm -hmm. and so I went home to my <laughs> So I came out of the regression and I was like, oh my God, you know, and I felt like I had lost five pounds from crying and, and screaming and teeth chattering and sweating. And Barbara was, you know, she was using cassette tapes back then and she gives me my little cassette tape and I go home and I play it for my boyfriend and he's like, oh my God, you know, like, what is this going to do to our relationship? <laughs> my poor girlfriend, like, oh my God, you know, and I mean, he, he was obviously upset because if you believe it, it's one kind of reaction, and if you don't believe it, it's another. And he didn't know what to do with this. He just knew it was like no turning back situation, you know. So, um, I, I mean, I, I called my parents. I told my parents. I told them, you know, and nobody knew what to do with me. And you know, it's just so disturbing to your friends and family. It's so when you report, very, so like it's. And it must have been dramatizing to report that. It is, because you feel like it's real, you know, and everybody tries to talk you out of it. And and I'm like, but I had the body to match the experience, right? I had a physical thing that matched the memory. Uh -huh. And and people that didn't know me would say, oh, well, you just must, it must be a screen memory for something else. Like maybe you had an abortion and you feel guilty. And I'm like, okay, that might make sense, but I've never had an abortion. So that doesn't apply to me, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, next, what's your next theory? You know, like everybody kept trying to, to talk me out of it in one way or another. So I don't know what it was. Anyway, flash forward a few months. Um, my boyfriend was out of town and I was sleeping alone for a week and I woke up at, Three, at four o'clock in the morning, sharp, with the digital clock saying four zero zero, and it was like three mornings in a row, and I hadn't heard a noise. There was no reason I should be getting up at that time and looking at my digital clock that said four zero zero. I was like, what the hell? And um, the third morning, I got in the tub to shave because I was going to see my friend at the beach, and I had this fresh, like, triangular puncture wound, like small, in my leg that was like freshly scabbed with oh, three, wow. red, three red dots of blood, you know, like a fresh, like needle marks, okay, in the shape of a triangle. And I remember thinking, oh my God, that is some alien thing. I know I've seen that in a book or a video. Because at this time I had started recording 
shows on the Learning Channel and you know, there used to be all these alien shows on TV and I was recording them and like studying this stuff. So, so you just like, did, so you just like, you, did you have like a DVR or like a TiVo back then? Or is it like, I had a VCR back then. Yeah. And, um, so anyway, I, I found it in a book. I was like, that's it. That's the thing. I know that's an alien thing. So I made an appointment to do a regression with Yvonne Smith, who is a different person that also did or does she still does it alien abduction regressions and so I went to her office and I worked with her just as an experiment I didn't have a problem with Barbara I was just curious you know so in the regression with Yvonne I had it was interesting because I had the blue light again but instead of going up the ceiling I I, I was levitating and I t- turned and I went out the window of my bedroom it didn't um, break or crack feet, feet first no, it was like I went through the window, and and the sensation was like, you know, like if you stuck your arm in a bucket of room temperature water, and you wouldn't feel a change in temperature, you just feel a slight something, you know? Mm-hmm. It was like that. It was like I just I had a slight sensation. I don't know. It, it maybe, um, but I was back in the in the on the table with the beings, and this time. It wasn't a white, misty room. I don't remember the surroundings. I just remember there were little beings on three sides of me that had wrinkly, darker heads. Like, I want to say brown or gray. And they had, like, wrinkly heads. And I could only see the tops of their heads. I couldn't see their eyes or anything in the memory. And so, and then there was one tall one, like like before with the... But this one was really tall, and it had the white robe with the high collar and the big wraparound black eyes and a big white head, okay? And that one, I have a drawing of that one. So this one, I know it's hard to see, but, okay. So this one, he, uh, I was screaming and, and upset and crying, and I was looking at the little ones. There were three. There were, there, was, there were two on my left and one up here on the right. And I said, you make me scared of little kids because you look like little kids, but you're not little kids. And I was cussing at them. And one of them put its hand on my head. And I said, get your freaking hand off me, little bastard. I was cussing it out. Mm -hmm. But as it started rubbing my head, like all my anger just went, oh, it just, it like calmed me. And I I stopped screaming at it. And I said, just do whatever you want to do and let me go home. I was kind of surrendering okay and um <clears throat> it was interesting because later on when i went to roswell and i i met this lady bill hamilton in uh phoenix and his wife he was a researcher and his wife told me she had similar beings with the high collars and stuff and she showed me drawings and she and when i said i said one of them touched me and i it made me calm down and she said oh what did he do rub your forehead and I said, yes. And she said, oh, yeah, that's what they do when they want to calm you down. I was like, oh, my God. So there, the great thing about being in different support groups and things is you you share information and you find these commonalities that make it more, like, real. So that was interesting. Um, so the, the tall white one, the doctor, right, with the white robes, I remember fixating on its hands because to me the hands were very long fingers. But to me they were very beautiful, like um, – like an Albrecht Durer painting that I had studied in art history class. These very long, slender fingers. And I remember being kind of captivated by the beauty of the hands of this being. I don't know why. I was terrified. But um, anyway, it had, a, it had access to this, this rack that came out of the ceiling, and it had a wand on a tube that came out of the ceiling and so he he grabbed this this wand thing and he selected a tip and he put the tip on the wand and he just popped that that thing into my leg whatever that was it was like almost like a vaccination it was like so do you have pictures of that object. i did and you know i lost them but i sent them to dr roger i had one picture and i sent it to dr roger lear because he was going to our mufon in la and um you know I have this letter from him that you know I show during my, my presentations, but it basically says, it's dated July 25th, 1996, and it says, thank you for your letter of July 17th, 
and the enclosed picture. So I had sent him the picture, but now the picture is gone. I don't know what happened to it. It was truly an indication of a triangular lesion seen in the abduction phenomenon. I'm taking the liberty of sending you one of our screening tests. So he, he sent me a screening test and I filled that out and he wrote me another letter saying I scored very high probability and he wanted to proceed further. Well, I ended up working with Don Waldrop, who was the head of LA MUFON at the time. So he, he was, recommended. So, so sorry for interrupting, but he was like, um, uh, he, he was like Gray Anderson. Back um, then. Yeah, Earl Gray. Yeah, right? Earl Gray Anderson. Uh, he was the head of the, the region for, for LA and we had these huge meetings back then. Uh, like, you know, 150 people would come every month. Oh my god! Like so like, was oh yeah, they, we're at a big they, hotel room, you know, big ballrooms and hotels. So like, go. did they have like a dinner and everything with it too? No, no, just a meeting. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, but they were great. We had all the big names, and um, so so Don Waldrop at the time suggested that I um, work with this other doctor who was in the Navy, which is interesting. And I went to him, and he did an X-ray on my leg, and he said, "There's nothing in your leg." Um, but I had another thing in my tooth that my dentist found that I'll get to. And he wanted to take my tooth out. He was like, can we have your tooth? And I was like, no, I don't want to take my tooth out. So I kind of left it at that. Um, but because there was so much going on back in the 90s in MUFON LA. It was very exciting, just saying. So um, the next thing that happened was my dentist found this thing in my tooth. And it was it was weird because... This is my Beverly Hills dentist, okay? His name was Dr. John Roxarzade. And he was, um, he now he's in Las Vegas. He's still a dentist. And at the time, I had told him when I first started seeing him, all I did was I went in to get a cleaning and I had him replace all my fillings. So I had the, the mercury fillings and I had him replaced with the white fillings so that my teeth would look better because I'm an actress, right? So. I loved all my new fillings, but I had gone back to him and said, you know, they're all, they're all good, but this one is hurting me. Like it's really sensitive. And can you look at it and see if it looks good? And he said, well, the seal is good. I don't know why it's bothering you. Give it a little more time. So I, I went back to him and he, I, and I had told him when I first went to him, I said, I'm an, <laughs> I'm an alien abductee and I'm working with a hypnotherapist. And, and I've read that sometimes people freak out in the dentist chair because they have like a flashback. <laughs> and I said, Are you I have serious? never, yeah, I said, I have never freaked out in the dentist chair, you know, but if I ever do, I'm just, or if any of your other patients do, I'm just telling you that. I said, also, um, I said, if you ever find anything weird in my body, you have to tell me. And he was like, okay, lady. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he said, he said, actually, I have read a book about Roswell. So, you know, I'm not totally, I don't totally think you're crazy. And I said, thank you. So um, sure enough, when he went and looked at this one tooth that was bothering me, uh, he said, well, I can just redo it and we'll see what happens. I'll use a different brand of filling. And I said, okay, let's try that. So he digs it out. And while he's digging out my brand new filling, he finds this, what he described as a spherical or half spherical object in my tooth. And it was super hard and he was drilling and drilling at it and he was barely budging it. And at one point he got a mirror out and he showed it to me and he was tapping on it. And he said, do you see this? And I said, yeah. He goes, I've been drilling on this a really long time. And I said, yeah. And he said, this is not normal. This is, this, this is not your old feeling. I don't know what this is. And what do you want me to do? <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I mean, you're the dentist, right? And I said, um, just put the new feeling in and I'll, you know, I'll think about it. And he said, okay. I said, can you get a piece of it? And he said, no, it's so hard. It's just like turning into dust and it's going down the drain with the water. And I said, okay. Um, so anyway, he redid my filling and it stopped hurting. Like it fixed the problem. So I just, I left it at that. So I went to get a regression, right? I was like, oh my God, what is in my tooth? Like, is it a weird alien thing? So I went back to Barbara Lamb because I had been to her before and I'm, you know, like I said, I was experimenting with, with people and so we targeted uh, my tooth under hypnosis. And in this memory, I had a very surprising revelation in my hypnosis. Now, again, I don't know if it's real, if it's trustworthy. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I remembered. You can file it away with all the other abductee stories, you know.
But in my memory, I had uh, come to, I don't remember a light beam or anything like that in my bedroom. I just was in another exam room, but this time it was a human exam room. It had cabinets and like a shelf, you know, not a shelf, like, like countertop. It had a door. Um, and there were two guys in there, not aliens. There were two men in there, and they were dressed in lab coats. And they had khaki pants and black shoes. And they were standing around, and I was in there on the table. And I remember only a word. I remember the word troublemaker. It wasn't like they were speaking to me in sentences or anything that I could remember. And... Um, I remember them, one of them, t uh, taking a syringe and putting this syringe into my cheek like this, like squirting something into my jaw, through my, outside of my face, not, not up into my mouth, but like this, squirting something. And then they rolled, they put me on a gurney and they rolled me down a hall. And the other quality of this memory that was different from the aliens or whatever the aliens really are is that in the alien memories, if they're aliens, I felt super alert. I just couldn't move. Like I, my body couldn't move, but my brain was like high alert, right? And when I was with these two guys, uh, whatever you want to call them, pseudo military, you know, military so posture. So they, so they were military you know, aged? I don't know. They, they were military age. They had khaki pants and black shoes and lab coats. That's all I know. Um, so when I was with them, I felt drugged. I had a different consciousness experience with them. I felt drugged. I felt sedated. I felt barely aware. So anyway, we go down the hall on a gurney, and then we get to this big room with a black helicopter in it. I know that sounds really cliche, but that's what I remember. And... It had a retractable ceiling, and they put me in this helicopter, and the ceiling opened, kind of like, I want to say it was rounded, like, um, kind of like a telescope ceiling would open up, like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was daytime because it was very bright once that ceiling opened, and I remember being like, oh, it's so bright. And we went up, 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 and I rode in this helicopter, and then in my memory, if it's true or not, I don't know, I landed. Uh, we landed in this field below my house in Silver Lake and I recently went to that field and it's still there and it's still a field um, and I was told you know they, they told me to get out of the helicopter and go home and take a nap and I just remember that that's all I remember I don't remember walking home going in through my door I don't remember anything I just remember being told go home and take a nap so I have no idea how I got there and I have no idea what happened. I have no idea how they got me to that place, if that was a real memory. It was very frightening. And I came out of that regression. I was so angry. And I had this different anger that I had with the alien stuff. Like, with the alien stuff, it was more Frightened. fear and, wo and wonder, like wonderment and fear combination. But with the, with the human memory, it was like, I was so angry and afraid. And it was like, oh, my God. Like, if that's real... And that happened to me, and I didn't remember. Like, what the hell else has happened to me that I don't remember? You know, uh -huh. it's just this violation. It's very primal. And y your brain just goes like, oh, my God. You know, like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay? And um, so it was very frightening and angry. And the other weird thing was Barbara told me that I was her first, what's called, that's called a MILAB, military abduction memory, M-I-L-A-B. A military abduction I, memory? I've never heard of that that's one. A frequent, it's a frequent thing. Many many people like Melinda Leslie and a woman who went by the name Leah Haley would describe these abductions by humans, which would be done after you were abducted by aliens in order, usually they would say to interrogate you. Like, in other words, the military or the people, whoever they are, were trying to play catch up to, the, to what's happening with the abductees. So, so nothing would, like Men in Black? No, it's more like they want intel. Um, I don't know in my case what they were after, but from what I've read, they 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 want to know what the aliens are teaching people, showing people, revealing to people. They want to see if the person has any special skills or super abilities from working with the aliens. It's like intel gathering. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's that's what I've read. In my experience, I didn't have all that information. I just heard the word troublemaker. They put the thing in my tooth, whatever that was. And I was I was taken home. 
So, um, but Barbara said I was her first one in regression that had that kind of memory. And um, the cassette tape that she used to record the session, her, the recording did not work. I don't know what went wrong. She said she pressed record. You know, I would assume she she thought it was working, but it did not work. So I don't know if there was a way that somebody or something knew we were doing this session and they blocked it from being recorded or if it was just a pure technological glitch. I don't know what happened. It was very odd. But I was angry because I wanted a recording of it and I didn't get one. So that was very weird. Okay, now we can stop at this point. I have so many stories, but that's like the beginning of my stories. Okay, so um, uh, so let me tell you about what's going on a little bit. Um, the crazy thing is these... It's insane. LA is a hotbed for UFO sightings and abductions. The reason why as well is because it's, it is kind of like a volcanic caldera in a social form. Have you, if you remember the Rodney King riots in 1992, right before it happened, there was numerous abductions and UFO sightings because it was akin to a super eruption. The Rodney King e right eruption of 1992, and I studied this, ejected as much material as Lake Toba's super volcanic eruption 74,000 years ago. Um, uh, Geology Hub did an erupt did a video on that eruption. 13,200 cubic kilometers of material. The Rodney King eruption belted just as much as that. But how would we perceive that? What do you mean in the physical world that we would notice? We well, would notice is just mainly the destruction, the eruption columns, the fires, the injuries, and the deaths from it. Um, you and then also, and you could tell LA is different nowadays from what it was in 1992. It looks different. Different. It's not. Now, are you saying this is on a physical level or on a, like a spiritual level or? It's kind of like on a spiritual. Level? It's it's. It's spirit. It's spirit. It's more like a social energetic level. Okay. But because of the damage, it's and the way LA looks like, it's kind of like a ring. Hence the caldera, because you had all this stuff cave in. And so we've had a lot happen lately. It's been crazy lately with the violent crime, and we had this huge fire under the I-10 freeway on Saturday, and now the I-10 is shut down in downtown, which is going to cause insane traffic for a long time while they evaluate the whole structure underneath it was a raised freeway right uh -huh. right through downtown it's like a huge disaster that happened over the weekend yeah and it's like i recently just did a thing on tiktok about it more than likely it was a small resurgent dome that might have likely collapsed and it's like the thing is um and if you notice a lot of ufo sightings right before that happened too right when a disaster happens Aliens want to see what's going on down there. I'm like, uh-oh, something's about to go down. Yeah, I have heard that, and I've certainly seen a lot of videos of UFOs entering and exiting active volcanoes. And also, uh, you have the Long Valley Caldera in eastern California, which is a volcanic caldera. It's so around 7,400, around about the time the Yellowstone last blew, 760,000 years ago, its super eruption was just as bad as the Yellowstone eruption 640,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when it comes yeah, to- California is very active. Oh yeah, and it comes to riot eruptions, the Rodney King is the big kahuna. It's the big boy on the block. And if we were to have something like that happen again, he would knock out technology all over California. Yeah. It, it, I'm, I'm very nervous living here. I've always been nervous living here. We actually moved away for 10 years. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, because I'm from New Orleans, and I was living in Beverly Hills with my husband, you know, later on here in uh, 2005, and I was so traumatized watching that on TV. I thought California's going to fall off into the ocean. I want to get out of here. Well, in <laughs> and order so for... we moved. We moved to Arizona for 10 years, and it was great. We lived in Tucson, but then we got bored and we came back. And now I'm like, I don't know. I kind of want to get out of here. <laughs> because you know something. Because I think something's about to happen. I mean, with what's been going on, we are in line for a super eruption out of the Long Valley Caldera or the Rodney King Caldera. Right. And if we have another Rodney King-sized eruption, 
um, you bet that it's going to cause other riots to happen, like in San Francisco, a.k.a. the Golden Gate Caldera. And you don't want that there because yeah. all of the tech companies reside in that caldera. And if that happens, you can kiss all the technology goodbye mm-hmm. because it will be wiped out. I wouldn't be out. surprised. I wouldn't be surprised at this point. And yeah. it's like I, I live. I live really far in the suburbs, but still, I, I don't. Still, I don't, you're inside. I'm very nervous yeah, there. you're inside of the county, so you're going to be vaporized if it goes off. Like 1992, you're just going to go like it's like hell. You still be quick. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, God, ca- God help us all. Yeah, I know. It's not. Uh, it's like, and here's the thing. Mm-hmm. We're going to see more abduction cases. We're going to see more UFO sighting cases. Hence the reason. Why I have to go buy in these guys? Yeah, thank you so much because now this is the one terabyte. This is another one terabyte. This is a two terabyte. And then I have two terabytes in the Dropbox and one terabyte in the OneDrive. So it's yeah. like, um, I'm prepared for all the stuff that's coming down the pipeline. And paranormal wise, it is getting a lot worse in LA. There is a lot of haunted spots in LA. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, moving on with my story, um, so what happened next was the good story. I have one good story from all this. So what I found was that um, I was catching myself saying things. This is like now we're, we're like in 1997, 98, somewhere around there. And I was catching my language saying things like, oh, humans this, humans that. Like I was talking like, like I wasn't human, but I had no... I don't know why I was talking like that. So I went to Barbara and I said, Barbara, why am I talking like this? I said, I have this feeling like I miss some beings. Like I have this longing, but I don't know who it's for. And I don't think it's for the ones that had me on the table. Like, can we target that with hypnosis? And she said, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. So she put me under hypnosis and I had this freak out panic attack. Like, I had this experience. It was like someone, I started screaming, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this body. It's so weak. And I'm screaming. And I had this feeling like total panic attack. Like I was, like I was sofa sized and I was being stuffed in a pillowcase. Like Uh I just had this claustrophobia feeling. And she said, well, go to a time when you felt, you know, powerful and happy and yourself and whatever. So, I popped out of of that feeling of claustrophobia and I was in space. I was in space and I'm looking at earth. And to me, in my perception, I was a blue light, like a blue light, no form. Okay. And I recognized two other blue lights in space that were my friends. And I was crying and I was like, Nicole and John. And I'm crying. I recognize them, even though we didn't have form. We were just blue lights, like, like spheres. And I was looking at earth and earth to me was spinning fast. And I remember looking at it and feeling all this anxiety, like, uh, like being on the edge of a diving board. Like, I don't want to go there. Right. And I said, I don't want to go to earth. And she said, well, why do you have to go to earth? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, ask, why do I have to go to earth? So I asked this, and these light beings appear in my whatever this is, hypnosis, out-of-body experience. And these light beings are like, they're white light, and they're bigger than us. And they have more of a, like a humanoid form underneath, Uh you know. And I don't know what they were, angels, I don't know what they were, angels, light beings, I don't know what they were. But when I saw them, I felt like this pure love and oneness and overwhelming like ecstasy like weeping like happy tears just like (gasps) you know overwhelmed like oneness and merging and all this and I said they're my home they're my family and I was crying and I was so happy and and I said they're wearing white robes and that's why I wear a white robe I had a white bathrobe right at the time Mm -hmm. and 
and I'm saying all this, I'm mumbling all this stuff, and 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 I and I'm like, why do I have to go to Earth? And they said the Earth needs you. And I said, why? And they said to fight evil. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> How do I do that? And they said, with your acting. And I was like, seriously, because like so much that gets made is just crap. And you know. And they said, don't worry, we will set it up so that you meet people and make projects worthy of your time. And I was like, okay. Yes, please. Okay, show me. And I said, am I supposed to like lecture about you? And they said, no, you're supposed to do it in your acting. You will reach more people. And I said, okay. So um, it was weird. So, and then they showed me this really cool image and it was like God or, you know, some source energy light, right, was coming through space going through them and then they're like their arms were st were stuck out like this and then the light was coming to earth at us but we were walking around with umbrellas like it, they showed me this image of like we're always here sending you this love and you you guys are walking around with umbrellas and it was like they were trying to get through to us it was this really beautiful image and so that was that regression and it was so it was so blissful and happy in the moments with them that it kind of eclipsed like my whole, I don't know. It was just like it overrode my whole experience of this phenomena, right? Like the negative alien stuff, whatever that was, the military stuff, whatever that was. This, this light being experience was so awesome that it was like, wow. To so get more to like it wasn't all that to get to this was totally worth it. <laughs> so like it was so that more like wasn't an adoption. It was a contact. It was like a real time out of body experience. Could like you like an OBE, uh -huh. like an induced? It was like a hypnotically induced OBE. OBE. Okay, and then do you think it could have been? You might have had an encounter with God. It could have been. I mean, it felt like. God, like angels, like it felt that good. I mean, when people describe near death experiences, it was similar to that, only I was not near death, right? It yeah, so an and, and, and NDE. Yeah, so, so what, what they call that is an OBE, out of body experience, because you're not near death. Yeah, and near death saying? experience would be slight NDE. Differentiation. Yeah. Right, so that, so the NDE is, is the catalyst, is the, the physical nearness of death, the injury event but for me it was just a hypnosis induced experience so, uh, so it was really it was really awesome so tell me about what happened when you were younger because you also had an ex alien abduction when you were younger well i was told that i've had many like as i re-examine my life you know when you when you get this experience you so your brain goes into overdrive with like why me why me has this happened before? Was there are, were there other clues? And you and you go through all these things, and you think like through the past, you know, like what were the other indicators? So I certainly had indicators. For one thing, I had really severe nosebleeds as a child, and that's a sign of uh, this interference where they put objects up up your nose. Um, I had to have my nose cauterized when I was little. And I would wake up in the morning with all this blood on the pillow. I had paranormal fears as a child. I didn't have fears of people. I had fears of paranormal stuff happening to me. Um, I had a fear of my closet. I remember I had this, it was a wig stand. Have you ever seen those styrofoam heads that they oh, put yeah, wigs like, on? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. So my mom had a wig stand head in my closet on the shelf. And so if the door of the closet was open and I could see that white head you know I was like uh-uh I can't sleep with that I would have to get up and <laughs> it's too door. creepy yeah and then so okay so that and then the fears I had of things that were similar what people describe as uh, reptilians actually I used to when I was a kid and the creature from the Black Lagoon movies were out I was terrified of that thing I was terrified of the, there was this show called the land of the lost that came on on Saturday mornings it was a kid show and they had it was about these people that travel in time through a portal and go back into the dinosaur days. And they had these reptilian creatures that were associated with these machines that were like portals with crystals on a table and all this high tech. And they were called the Slee Stacks. So I was so scared of the Slee Stacks. And um, 
that you know they put a lot out through Hollywood, right? They they put a lot of information out to either shape the public perception subconsciously or overtly to be prepared for what's going on. Uh, so anyway, those were big influences when I was a kid. Um, I also lived by the woods, and I remember I used to walk through the woods to go to my piano teacher's house because she lived one street over, but you had to go through the woods to get there. And I used to walk through the woods to get to her house, but then one day something happened in the woods, and I would not walk through the woods anymore, and I used to make mom drive me to her house. And I'm, I was like, what What was that about? Like, what? Did I just see a snake? Or, or like, why? Why don't I remember what happened? Because it was a big thing. Whatever it was, it was like, okay, I'm not walking anymore. Um... I don't have missing time as a kid. I just had, those were pretty much my signs. And then also I was passed around a lot as a kid. I was adopted. I was born to a teenage mother and then I was, I was kind of passed around the family and I lived with different people until I was four when I was officially adopted. So for a year I lived with my uncle's family in Huntsville, Alabama and they were very oh, sweet. NASA. Yeah, he's a NASA, he was a NASA engineer. <gasps> oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah. So I lived with him. This was in the late, I, I, I was born in 66. So this was probably like 68-ish, 67, 68, where I lived with him for a year. So right with around wife, during Apollo 8. Yeah, I was like major NASA activity. And he was, he worked on the Saturn V. He worked <gasps> on the front run. He worked on all these things. He was a mechanical engineer. Oh my engineer. God, oh my God, oh my God. I'm freaking I out, know. I'm freaking out. And so what, what freaks me out is that you know, when I think back on that and knowing that so many abductees have military industrial complex, aerospace industry uh, relatives, right? Um, like, was I put in a program because my uncle was part of NASA? Was I on a list? Like, if, if Eisenhower really made a deal with the aliens, like biology for technology, did that, did that like put me on a list? Like, okay, if your family's in the loop, then you're on the list of people they can abduct because we have a way of kind of tracking you. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just speculating, and I, I'm not blaming my uncle. Uh, I'm not saying my uncle knew anything about UFOs. So I, I've asked him. He's he's dead now. He died of COVID a couple of years ago. Oh no! He was very sweet, and he he told me. Um, he told me. He said, Camille, I don't know anything. If it's true, it's NSA, and they're never going to tell you and you just have to get over it. And another thing he said was, when I was, he was a jogger, and he said, when I would jog, sometimes I would go out of body and I would see myself from above while I was jogging. And he said, that's the only way I can relate to what you're explaining to me. Um, but you know, I, when I made friends with Chris Bledsoe later on, who's got NASA contacts, he said, Camille, your uncle, even if he knew anything, he could never tell you because he signed a huge stack of NDEs and he would lose his pension, he would go to prison. He he cannot tell you if he knows anything. So, so the stack was that like, don't, what, is it this big or something? <laughs> I don't know. But same thing with my cousin. Like if my cousin, his daughter who works for NASA, if she knows anything, she can't tell me. So as much as I push her, she can't tell me anything. And I, I can't. I can't expect my family to tell me anything. So what did that. your daughter do for, what did your like sister or daughter do for NASA? My cousin, my cousin, yeah. yeah. Um, she is, she works with the, the space shuttle. She oh. is in, in charge of the stuff that gets loaded onto the shuttle. Ooh, she so, started, she started, uh, started payloaded. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, uh. I know. It's I am upset. I, just you know, I'm I, obsessed I do with think NASA. I, have, well, I do think I have um, experiences in my family line on my mother's side, which is the side that my uncle is on, right? Because mm -hmm. I asked my birth mother once, um, like, have you ever had any experience with the paranormal or beings or something weird happening? And she said, well, once I was meditating and I felt these two claws on my shoulders. And I was like, Spooky. okay, that's weird. And then, and, then, and then when my grandmother, their mother, you know, my mom and my uncle and my other mom, their, when their mother, my grandmother, who partially raised me, when she was very sick and old, um, she was in the hospital a lot. And at one point she was, she was hysterical in the hospital saying that she saw aliens in the hospital. Aliens and in I the had, hospital? Yeah, and I had, I had told her about my alien stuff and the whole family was mad at me. They're like, why did you tell her about that? Now she's hallucinating aliens in the hospital. And I said, well, 
first of all, I'm sure she's on all kinds of medication and we don't, you know, people hallucinate sometimes. And I said, second of all, maybe she wasn't hallucinating. Maybe she really could see beyond the veil and she could see aliens in hospitals. So don't blame me, you know. Um, so there could be like a, a lineage thing on my grandmother's side, um, which would affect maybe my uncle and my mom and, you know, all of us. Did he work on, on did your uncle work side. on the Saturn V? Like, what did he do for the Saturn yeah. V? I don't know, but I know he worked on that. I know later. Do you remember the tethered satellite with the Italians, the one that broke and it got swarmed by UFOs? Do you remember that from the from the 90s, I think? I uh, he heard about on it online. It was like STS something. I forget the number. But it was, it was like a tether that they were pulling, and then it broke off, and it was floating, and it got swarmed by these lights, and there's all this cool footage of it. He worked on that. Oh, that's so cool. And it's so, like, and if, by the yeah. way, um, it's like, guys, if you know, if you're wondering why some of the, some of the stuff was delayed, Ken Mattingly passed away. He was part of Apollo 13, and I was not a happy boy that day when I found out he passed away. I was like, no. I was I, okay. I was I was roaming around Sandy that night, not in a good mood. People were pissing me off that night, and I'm like, okay, who wants to get it beat up first? And I'm like, Ken Mattingly just passed away. He's from Apollo 13. And then another one, another astronaut, another NASA person passed away right after, like right before that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Seriously, stop yeah. dying. I know, I went to this thing in, in Tucson when I lived there called Space Fest. And the astronauts come to this event and they, sign autographs you know and sell photos and stuff like that and it's it's really neat then they have lectures and I went to this event it was at the Marriott Star Pass and I met uh, Edgar Mitchell before he died what and Buzz Aldrin. No, hold up. yeah they were all there signing hold pictures up. Of hold up. Space Fest. hold up time Edgar Mitchell passed away when yeah. start talking oh, years ago I mean I it was years ago I don't know you have to look it up but I, I saw him before that and it was, I lived in Tucson from 2005 to 2015. So it was, it was maybe 2010. I was at this thing. I can't remember which year. But yeah, they would oh. have it all the time there. They probably still have it in Tucson. Okay, yeah. that does not make me very happy. Edgar Mitchell was Sorry. cool. I know. He started IONS and he worked with Rebecca Hardcastle Wright and he was very much about ETs. Oh, yeah. okay. You ever, okay. Um, you ever heard of um, Bob Sabrell? Um, he actually did our first episode of the conspiracy corner and oh, no. yes um, we decided to put that on just you know because people want their opinions right and he and it's part of ET and all that stuff and you know it's part of the pop culture of you know yeah, yeah. did we go to the moon yeah. did we not go to the moon and so I, Bar did Bar I know. Bart I'm Sabrell, on the fence about that so Bart Sabrell came on to the show and the, he was our very first big, big, huge celebrity on our show. Mm -hmm. He was our very first one surpassed five, seven point two k views. Before he just got obliterated by Jesse Peak for Mufon. <laughs> just wiped yeah. out. I mean, like yeah. ten. I, I think it's getting close to. Uh, I think it might have hit eleven k already. Mm -hmm. But I looked at projection through uh, TubeBuddy. I think. And it's probably going to hit 12 to 13K. That's an, that's skull candy says right there. I have, I have another NASA story for you, some trivia. So here's some wild stuff. So in the late 90s, sometime, I, I'm trying to remember the year, but I, I have our time, but I went to visit my Huntsville relatives. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to the NASA gift shop at the, the Redstone Arsenal Space Center thing. They have this big tourist attraction thing there. Like you can go to space camp and do all these neat things and have this huge gift shop. And I went to the gift shop and they had all this alien stuff for sale. Like oh my God, that was t shirts so cool. and mugs and they had figurines on the wall. I remember very specifically looking at they had these figurines in a box and it was like the Nordics, the the Greys, the reptilians, the, the they had like all these little figurines you could buy. And I was like, holy crap. Like, I bet they were like, like super tiny and cute. They were. They weren't like full Barbie doll size. They were like, you know, 
six inches or less. I know, and just they were, they were in a little tiny. And I, and I was like, what is this doing here? Oh, my God. And I remember I bought a, <laughs> uh, like a, there was like a plastic cup with a straw that I bought that had aliens on it. And I bought this black gray shirt that had a glow in the dark gray on it. And, um, and what was weird is that I went back, you know, to, to LA and then I went back to Huntsville a couple of years later. I wish I had the exact dates. So it was like the mid nineties. And then I went back maybe the early two thousands and I went to the same gift shop and everything was gone that had an alien on it. They had not one item in there with an alien on it. Everything was NASA, 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 you know, just straight NASA. There was not one image, nothing of an alien. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so having that before and after, you know, was like, I bet they were going to do disclosure in the late 90s. And then something happened and they changed the plan. That is right. Just... dude. I mean, because you have all this, you have all this alien merch. Yeah. And, and then it was it gone. disappears. Oh, like I bet there was a ton of like shirts and blankets. There was everything. I was like in heaven, right? And then I go back and it's stripped. Nothing. It was all straight, strict NASA missions and straight NASA stuff. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I nothing. still hoard all that up because I'd get me a NASA blanket because this is just an Angry Birds blanket right here. You can see on camera. Uh, I'd get me a uh -huh. NASA. I'd get me a NASA <laughs> blanket. Get me a NASA vets. Uh, everything. And that, but dude, an alien yeah. one, that'd be so sick. Okay, here's another weird thing. So, same visit to Huntsville, one of those years, I can't remember which one. So, while my grandmother was living at, with my, you know, all, the whole compound was in, in Huntsville for a while. Not me, I was out in LA, but my grandmother was living there, my uncle, my cousins, and then my moms would come and take turns taking care of my mom. I mean, taking care of my grandmother, because she was bedridden, right? So. One of my moms, when she was living there, my birth mom, she was house cleaning for a lady just to make spare money while she was, you know, taking care of my grandmother. And this, this lady um, was married to a NASA guy who worked on the Chandra telescope. And so she said, we got to go over to her house and I got to clean up and then, you know, you can come with me. She said, their house is really cool because he's into sci-fi and he has this whole room in his house dedicated to sci-fi. And I was like, okay. So we walk into his house, and I remember I had gone there for like, I want to say it was Thanksgiving, because it wasn't Christmas, but they had their, they had their Christmas decorations up already. Do you get it? You know how some people do that at Thanksgiving time. Mm -hmm. So they had like I walked in their house, and they had a nativity scene, like the stable with the baby Jesus and the whole thing, right? They had that on a on a, like a thing in their foyer, just like I had at my house, and on, on the top of the stable, they had a gray alien figurine and I remember freaking out when I walked in their house because back on at my house on my nativity scene I had little toy plastic aliens on the roof oh that's so cool and I was like what is going on <laughs> why does this NASA dude have this on his baby Jesus scene what does he know right what is what is going on here I'd be like, okay, and, start talking, yeah. or I'm, oh, yeah. start talking. I never met him. He wasn't there. <laughs> but I was like, I mean, my eyes were like, I am not seeing this. Seriously, this is what I have at my house. And I thought I was the only one who had this on their manger scene, right? And that was weird. I'm just saying, NASA knows a lot. And it does, they, they don't want to tell us. Now, one thing is, um, Bart Sabrell told me that, the moon landing was faked. Now, here's the thing. The reason why he... and There's a lot of anomalies that yep. appear in the moon landing. What they really don't want you to see is all the alien stuff that happened during the Apollo missions that the astronauts saw. Yeah, pros, pros, probably is that they staged a moon landing movie some say Stanley Kubrick was involved. We don't know, but there's all these anomalies with the whole staging of it and the lighting and this and that. So they had this packaged event film that they presented to us like it was real time. But in, in reality, they had a whole other scenario that was happening. That's, I mean, that's, that is one of the theories. I don't know anything. I'm so mm -hmm. open-minded. I look at everything. I'm like, I don't know. What do I know? 
So but like, all I know is, you know, I, I have looked at a lot of that stuff. So I get you. And yeah, and guess what? Get ready. Because we might do a cons- we might do a part two of that, except if if with um Cameline a uh, Cameline? Camille. Camille? Uh it's with it's gonna be with Camille instead of um Bart Sabrell. I mean I may actually have her come on back onto the show and but we actually may do it with Camille. Because Camille is a Hollywood actor in the Hollywood er- like area. Yeah. So we're well, t- yeah. yeah. I mean that'd be really cool to have the part two of the conspiracy corner. We did not go to the moon. Or did we land on the moon? I don't know. I don't know if I wanna take a side on that. But <laughs> let's let's skip ahead in my story. Okay, so um, now we're around nineteen ninety eight. All this has happened, you know. Um, and I had this positive experience with these light beings, right? And then I decided I had to go to England to see the crop circles in 1998. So in July 1998, I went to England by myself to see the crop circles. And it was amazing. And what's really weird, because people talk about synchronicities a lot with this phenomenon. And I was also, since I was 15, obsessed with the singer Sting from the police. You know, the, his name is Sting. You're so young, you probably don't know who he is, but... <laughs> He's this great singer from England, okay? And I had seen him in concert a million times, and I had all this music, and I was crazy about him. And he lives in England. Well, uh-huh. he lives in Malibu, too. He has houses all over the world. So I, I knew that he lived right by crop circle country in Wiltshire, which is the, the county where most of the crop circles would appear. And I knew he lived in this big old mansion in the country. So I, I went to England. I went out to his mansion I had this friend that I hooked up with in the Sting fan club and she showed me how to get there and we went there we took like a train and a bus and a taxi and you know to get to his house in the middle of nowhere and uh, so a little car was going through the gate and the gate opened and Sting was standing in the driveway like it was a really long driveway but he was standing there waiting for this person that was coming in and I almost died I was like oh my god he's standing in the driveway (laughs) and I'm standing out in the street and I had a camera hanging on my neck, and I was, like, paralyzed. Like, I couldn't even move. I was, like, I didn't even wave. I was just, like, oh, my God, he's right there. Oh, my God, he's right there. And then the gate shut, and I was, like, I didn't even wave. <laughs> I'm such a wimp. What happened to me? You know, I was, like, starstruck. And um, so I went back the next day. I Not with that girl, but I, I was on a bike. Kind of like girls like, with BTS. We were just crazy fans. Like she was on. She direction. was calling a cab. She was in like this little red phone box calling a cab, and she missed the whole thing. She was so upset. But anyway, so I went back the next day on my bicycle because I was staying in a nearby village, and I, I had bought him some flowers, and I made him this little card, like a crop circle postcard, and I wrote a note, like I came all the way to England just to see your house and see the crop circles, and I was putting this at the gate, like on the ground, right, and all of a sudden. The gate opens and I'm like, oh my god! And the security guy comes up and he says, uh, "You were here yesterday." And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> he said, he, "I said, well, I had to come back once I knew he was in town, you know." And he goes, "Well, I'll make sure he gets the flowers. Thank you." And I said, "He goes, how long have you been a fan?" I'm like, "Since I was 15, you know, <laughs> and, uh, since 1983." And um, anyway, he he was really nice. So the gate shut, but. Um, then Barbara Lamb picked me up because she was in town to see the crop circle. She's also a crop circle expert. And she, she picked me up and she said, um, okay, we're going to your first crop circle. This was the next day in the morning. And she said, it just happened last night and we're going we're gonna to go into it first thing this morning. And, you know, so we get there and it's kind of drizzly and can't really tell what it looks like yet from the ground because nobody knew yet. Uh, so we're walking through it and taking pictures and all this. And then later on, we go to the Barge Inn, which is where all the crop circle people hang out. And they put the pictures on the bulletin board, and they have planes that fly over and take pictures. And we found out that the crop circle from the air looked like a stingray, and they were calling it the stingray. And so I was like, whoa, like what are the odds that, I, that I'm a sting fanatic? And my first crop circle, my first crop circle, is called the Stingray. Like, that's cool. Don't you think? 
So like was that is insane. So like was Sting the Police? That was like a Paul era, right? Like sixties, seventies. The wait, Sting who? What? The, the Sting the Police, the dude. No, that was the seventies. Oh, that well, okay. So that was like mid seventies or late seventies. Mid, mid to late seventies was the Police into the early eighties, and then they broke up, and then he became a solo artist. Okay, so he was like early Space Shuttle era. I'm and sorry, I've seen I'm a, him, I'm a I've nerd. Seen him like I'm a... 40 times. No, I've seen him in concert. I went to Paris to see him in an opera. I was a super fan. I was like a stalker. I've met him three times after that, and he was really nice. So oh, that's wow. good. So um, what other, like, now, did you, have you ever, and we'll talk about this in a, another interview down the road, but did you ever have any paranormal experiences, like hauntings, experiences, or anything no. like that? No. I even spent the night in a haunted house. Now, this is a weird story. Okay, there's this famous haunted house in Louisiana where I'm from, and this was in high school or early, no, early college. I spent the night with a group of new agey people I was hanging out with, um, and <laughs> it was called the Myrtles Plantation in St. Francisville, Louisiana. It's very haunted. It's on all those shows, like when you watch shows about haunted houses. Ghost, it's, it's ghost hunters, very, ghost adventures. Yeah, like you could look it up on YouTube and you would find tons of videos about the Myrtles Plantation. It's a and, very big paranormal investigator yeah. hotspot. Yeah, and so I spent the night there with these friends of mine, and I remember the next morning, you know, we're all like, okay, did, did you see anything? Did anything <laughs> happen? And I slept through it. I was like, nothing happened to me. But two of my friends that had stayed up later and walked around the property, they said they saw a UFO. What? Was like, what? They had a sighting like, there? Not, yeah, that's like, and I wasn't even into UFOs back then. And so I remember all of us were like, a UFO? Wait a minute, this isn't known for UFOs. This is, we were supposed to see ghosts. What the hell? You know, like, that's <laughs> weird. And so now I think back and I'm like, whoa. Because I know there's all this overlap, you know, with the these portals or want to call it these these hot spots so i i just i don't know i don't know what happened i don't remember anything and so tell everybody where they can find you get your books and stuff and all that oh i don't have a book i i am working on a book um i i'm at camille james on okay. my website and then i have twitter camille underscore harman on twitter and instagram camille james harman on instagram um and I'm still an actress. I'm in this group, Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. We had our big launch luncheon a couple of weeks ago, and it was really awesome. And there's some really big names in the group, so it's oh, just a place. Oh, I wish where... I would have been there. I would have been in seventh heaven, it except was, I would have been. Amazing. Except I would probably need a bigger hard drive, though. <laughs> oh, I sat next to this guy. Um, he had just found out about it because there was a big article in this Hollywood uh, website called Deadline, and he, he he was a producer, and he was sitting next to me. And um, I said, oh, so what do you produce? He goes, alien movies. I'm going to make alien movies. I said, okay, great. And, um, and I said, what have you produced that I know? And he goes, well, I produced Hacksaw Ridge. And I was like, holy crap, wow, wow. <laughs> so, you know, some big people were there from, from Hollywood. And um, I'm, on, I'm on both sides, right? I have a foot in the Hollywood world, and I'm an experiencer. So some people are just not experiencers. They're just Hollywood. And some people were just ufo experts like nick pope we had not not to mention who was in the room but we had a zoom meeting going on with all these other members who were from various locations so we had amazing people go look on the website hollywood disclosure alliance and we'll have everything in a comment we'll even have a pinned comment where you can check out all the links and we'll have it in the description also yep. we're gonna have more people from the hollywood disclosure connection uh um, we have one of the founders here that's right yeah, I'm a founding member, and what we're the purpose of the group is to bring together entertainment people with UFO people, and make more projects, documentaries, fictional, whatever. But that's based on the true stories coming out of the UFO world, and also to push disclosure through entertainment. Right. So the more people watch shows about, you know, real stories and documentaries, things like Skinwalker Ranch and whatever, ancient aliens, you know. UFO stories, the more they, they like, you know, wrap their heads around the scale of this phenomenon and the more they prepare themselves for what is coming. Because we all know this is escalating. There's some oh, shit yeah. and, and guess here's the thing. There is going to be disclosure. I know that. Yeah. And when disclosure, I mean, it's already happened. 
do, do you think there's going to be riots when it goes full disclosure? I don't think they're going to be right. I think the riots are being engineered right now to keep people fighting amongst themselves because I think the world is being, you know, we have this new world order trying to take over the world, basically. And so <clears throat> they're stirring up all kinds of problems because that's what they want to do. Yeah, because and nothing chaos, big has had, can, nothing you know, big has, yeah, sorry. Like, nothing big has happened in the U.S. yet, which I hope not. I don't want another VEI-8 in the U.S. again. We don't need another George Floyd riot eruption. I don't need a okay. Rodney no, King. There, there are very, thing, very big things happening in the U.S. right now. There are riots happening all over the U.S. right now over this Middle East war. And we have an invasion on our southern border. And we have had one for three years. We have had a full-on invasion. So, like, so a full-on military type invasion? Up. No, like there are all these military age men coming over the border that are being unvetted, that are from China, all over the Middle East, all over the place. They're being activated once they get here. There's terror cells. There's all kinds of stuff that's about to blow. I really feel that. So do you? So um, what I, you know, as a as a USGS rhinologist slash volcanologist, um, I and I'm gonna tell you guys this right now. I need to, now these are just now we have protests going on okay these are protest quakes okay but we are we the, we are showing signs of a super eruption happening in the US uh, not a super volcanic eruption but a super riot eruption and ladies and gentlemen we need you to prepare emergency preparedness and prepping is the best way to prevent yourself from getting unalived by our pyroclastic flow, which um, sadly, Camille is right in the middle of one of the called, if, if, if you're right near a resurgent dome, which, yeah. why yeah. did you move right next to one of the 13 resurgent domes of the Rodney King caldera? I'm like. I, I, it's my husband loves it here, my son loves it here. I really have never felt comfortable here. I'm more comfortable in the south, on the east coast. I Those are my good places. I'm married to an astrologer, okay? And Ooh. you can tell your best place is to live using astrology. It's called astrocartography. All my good energy lines are on the east coast. I should be living in Virginia, Florida, where my relatives live. I would be very happy over there. Do you, so you think, so yeah. do, you, do you think, now, as a Hollywood actress, okay, and this is on air, this is on TV, do you think that we are going to see a super riot eruption? Now, we haven't seen any large scale. We already seen one riot eruption. That happened just the other day with the a freeway thing. That was only a VEI-6, okay? But do you think we're going to see a big, huge one? Like super eruption, VEI-7, VEI-8? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know about all this volcano stuff. All I know is that everybody is on edge. In this city, we had a strike, the actor strike that just ended. It shut down all Hollywood production pretty much for like months. So there are all these peripheral jobs. Not just the actors were out of work. Everybody was out of work. The parking attendants at the studios, everybody. There was nothing happening. Okay, What that did to our economy here was tremendously destructive. There were actors living in their cars. There were people committing suicide because they couldn't pay their bills. It was extremely destructive to shut down the industry here for that long because we live in a very high cost of living city. It's very expensive just to survive here. We have insane gas prices, insane mm -hmm. rent prices. We have crime running rampant. It's really bad. Okay, I, mean, I don't know why I stay here. And here's honest. the thing. Husband Take a look son. at the bad side of Hollywood because you're on the good side of Hollywood because we've had to report on the – and we can't – a lot of the stuff we can't say here on TV yeah. without getting demonetized. But um, there is some evil stuff going on in Hollywood. And if, like, if it is getting to the point where, like, um, you know, Nickelodeon – now, no one wants to like ha, like, no one wants to work with Nickelodeon. There is so many predators in no Nickelodeon now that Tom Kenny, he was the guy that voiced SpongeBob. He even said that, and sadly he passed away. But he even said, if you don't take care of the predator problem, we are 
shutting down SpongeBob went. I mean, you got these SpongeBob yeah. and like um, I, I Kenneth hear Tuck, about that stuff too. Kenneth Tucker, the guy who did Fairly Odd Parents, Danny Phantom, all these wholesome actors, writers for these popular Nickelodeon shows that were prevalent in the 90s, Rugrats. Everyone is just sick and tired of what Hollywood has become. Yeah, and now that's, that's been around a long time. That's been a problem for a very long time. A lot of people have been vocal about it. And it's there's more and more coming out all the time. Do you think there's going to be a collapse of the um, uh, the film industry due to the predator I think issue? Be, I think there will be some kind of restructuring because I think the lawsuits and the the I think there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on behind the scenes and. Hollywood is being, um, it's very hard to film here. It's very expensive. They don't offer incentives. A lot of people are filming in other states. So even a lot of actors have fled and they live in other states. And they're like, you know what? When you want me, I'll fly to wherever we're shooting, but I don't want to live there. Considering the fact that from what it sounds like in this strike thing that was going on, I think it was like a dike intrusion. It was like a sudden surge of volatile social magma coming to the surface and that it, the Rodney King caldera, the riot caldera, it's kind of like a social volcano, a super volcano. But do you think it's ready to blow right now? It's already blown because of what happened just the other day. But do you think it's, a, it's about ready to have a big boy eruption from what it's going on right now? I mean, I've never seen the world in such a dire state. And being married to an astrologer, you know, my husband, Jeff Harmon, you can look at his YouTube videos and his interviews. He was on Coast to Coast a couple of weeks ago. I mean, he's he's seeing a lot of, there's some bad stuff going down all over the world, not just with the United States, but the United States particularly is going through a Pluto return. And Pluto returns signify destruction and rebirth. And so, Which yeah, means riots, volcanic eruptions. Have you heard of the... And a big shout out to Creative Society. Um, I was featured on their TikTok Live where I talked about uh, volcanology. I talked about Campe Flegri. I talked about the Yellowstone Caldera. I talked about the um, Long Valley Caldera. And because there's things that they think it's okay. I mean, you know, USGS thinks it's okay. But when you really start studying it and you really get down to the nitty gritty, it doesn't seem to okay what's going on right now. I'm sure it might be fine, but it's heating up real bad. Yeah, no, I feel it. I feel, I mean, every day, like in my daydreams, like I actually traded in my car and got an SUV because I was thinking subconsciously, like, I need a vehicle that I can pack my stuff into and get the hell out of here if I need to. Because, and I just think like that all the time. I think, where would I go? Would I go back to Arizona and stay with my friends? Would I go to all the way to Virginia or Louisiana or Florida? Like, where would I go to get the hell out of here? Because I think that way all the time. Well, the best thing to do is to earlier get out. Like, if you get out during like the like the protesting, not the riot eruption, but when it's when it's starting out and it hasn't fully super erupted yet, you should be able to escape. But if you well, get out, and uh, yeah, you, you need to leave. It's hard. It's hard because when you're t when your life is tied together with others and your work, it's hard to pick up and go. But I'm telling you, on a subconscious level, I wouldn't be surprised by anything. So you, so as this is straight from a Hollywood actress, you wouldn't be surprised if we have another Rodney King style event in L.A. Oh no, not at all. Which would wipe out California. It would cause a 12-year volcanic winter, uh, which if you remember in the 90s, like oranges were extremely high because of what happened with Rodney King. It, all the ash and everything, the soot destroyed all the crops. I mean, it, I don't remember that. I wasn't living here then. I don't, I don't remember any of that. I, I came here in 95, so. So like, and right still during the winter because it, and it was starting to get better then. But seriously, Rodney King, could be seen from the space, the riot eruption could be seen from the space shuttle. Now the eruption column rose 132 kilometers into the sky. Rodney King was the riot equivalent to the Lake Toba super eruption 74,000 years ago, which almost wiped out the human race. The caldera, the crater essentially, makes Toba look small. 
Toba's Caldera is 943 square miles. Okay, and guess what? There was even UFO sightings and alien sightings back then, when Toba blew up and Yellowstone blew up. Then, when um, Ronnie King happened, you had more UFO sightings. You had alien sightings in Hollywood. They were like saying, "Yeah, we're having a lot of sightings now." I know that in September, my husband saw two UFOs in Malibu while he was riding his motorcycle, like within a week, and. They were different looking craft. They weren't the same craft. One was over the ocean and one was over the mountains as he was riding. So um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. All I know is I. We're I'm expecting very a super eruption in the U.S. or on Camp Beflegri, which, um, you know, Creative Society is monitoring. It's getting bad in Italy. Um, like. Yeah, at now. Yeah. Uh, no, not at uh, Campe Flegri. The Flegarian Fields, it's, right, it's kind of by Mount Vesuvius. And Pozzolabri, the Pozzolabri, kind of over there, kind of there's like almost like a, you could where all the harbors is and stuff. Well, there's ground information up to 32 feet. Some places up to 46 feet. That means that magma is only 200 to 100 feet from the surface. There's some places in Campe Flegri where things are melting. You're getting roads melting. And because it's only 30 feet from the surface, we are going wow. to see a large eruption from the Campley Fregri super volcano. That, and if it did what it did 39,000 years ago and ejected around 900 cubic kilometers of material, we would go through another ice age. We would go through a volcanic winter. And it would be another, um, now, 1538, the Mount Tawambu, like the like, Camp Fregri erupted, but it only erupted at a VEI three. If it were to super erupt, it would erupt at a VEI eight or a VEI seven, and it would kill, I'd say, millions of people, if not all the population well, of Italy. I just pray. I mean, I just pray, and I go. You know what? God, you put me here on Earth at this time. Just let me be useful, and, you know. Put me where you want me. So if I if I suddenly get the heck out of here, we'll see. Or if I'm just here to help wake people up by doing podcasts and movies and whatever, you know. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> I don't know much. All I know is life is very interesting and exciting and kind of scary. Yeah, so I'm trying to stay when positive. You're in, yeah, but, it's especially yeah. when you're in the world's largest super, super volcano. I mean it's like you're essentially living what is Toba supersized. Toba was 943 square miles. Rodney King covers LA. And that's basically the name they gave it back in the 90s after everything was all over. But um, it covers Long Beach and LA County. That is about 7,000 square miles in length. That's 6,700 square miles long in every single direction. It is around 800, like it's around like 30 kilometers deep. It's, it makes Yellowstone look puny because Yellowstone's only 2,200 square miles where this puppy is 6,700 square miles. So I think you can eat your heart out Yellowstone. So if LA goes, where's host? Well, ladies well, and gentlemen, I, it I don't been... know what to say about that, but thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, guess what? Thank you guys so much for watching this intense, amazing abductee interview. This has been the alien, the UFO, the alien abduction UFO sightings of Camille. And what's your last name? James. James Harmon. Anderson. Yeah, I James have three Harmon. Names. <laughs> Camille James Harmon, just kind of like Jans Harmon, the uh, the former UF uh, MUFON director. Um, are you related to James Harmon? Mm. Okay. Okay. I'm like. <gasps> Whoa. But <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, Camille J James Harmon, this is the alien, this is her abduction UFO sightings. Just like we did with Gray, uh, Gray Graham, this is her stories. And ladies and gentlemen, it was such a treat to have her. Also, you should go check out Gray Graham's interview because he is an alien hybrid. Human? Reptilian or gray hybrid. That's right. We had an alien hybrid 
on our channel. And it's like, when I heard that, I'm like, okay, how many more of these solid state drives am I going to have to buy just to hold all these upcoming interviews? Um, Saber, I don't think this Terrier 2 terabyte is going to cut it. I think Weston Digital or Seagate, you need to get a hold of me. Send me one of your 12 terabyte of hard drives because that's what we're going to need to hold all these interviews. <laughs> oh my God, it's going to be intense. We have so much more to show you guys. We have more interviews, more unboxing and reviews. We have more Let's Play videos on the Techno Warriors TV Plays YouTube channel. And we're almost to 5,000 subscribers. We're almost to 1,000 followers on our TikTok channel. So, Techno Warriors on TikTok. And we'll, do you have TikTok, by the way? No. Okay. Um, yeah, so go, check, so go check out our TikTok. It is amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, you know what to do. You hit that like button if you like this video. Hit that dislike button if you did not like this video. And if you adored this video, you know what to do. All you have to do is strangle that subscribe button, slap that like button in the face, and pow right in the kisser. Ladies and gentlemen, have an awesome week. Thank you so much to Camille James Harmon for being actress. Camille James Harmon for being on the show. So if you watch um, Seamless, or what's the other show? Vice. Vice, you will recognize her from our show. We will see you in the next video. And ladies and gentlemen, get ready, because we're about to have a big MUFON member, another big MUFON member on our show. Jill, and here's the thing, December 7th, I will be at Salt Lake Library, or Library, with the Utah Ch MUFON chapter. That's right! I will be meeting MUFON for the very first time in person. Oh my god! Um, I cannot wait to go to my first MUFON event in Utah at Salt Lake Library. So, if you're in the UFOs and you live in Salt Lake, come and check out it, check it out. It's, I believe it's free to the public. You'll get to meet me. You'll get. To, uh, I don't know if Brian Lindley will be in there, but you'll get to meet Brian Lindley, and we might even just do his MUFON interview, just like we did at the Utah Paranormal Expo. And this was back in 2017 when I kind of first started doing interviews um, in the UFO stuff. We met Chase Kolensky. How's that for your first MUFON interview? She was our very first interviewee to go 2k views and check this out more than likely linda thompson she will go she'll probably hit 13 to 14k views so that's another mufon member and she's now the assist i think she's the assistant director she's assistant mufon director or state director yeah um that's gonna be that's gonna just shoot her straight up Move on. More than likely, will become the biggest interviewee channel, and could even be the biggest liked interview on the whole video channel. Like seriously, we have some of these videos that are like I think it's a video review of a power supply. It's like eighteen hundred views. Um, well, I don't think so anymore, because Move On is going to surpass that, and it will become the most liked video. In the channel's history. What do you think of that? That's great. I'm in MUFON. Yeah. So go MUFON. They are the staple of our channel. They are about to be the. They are actually the leader in our channel right now. Hence it's the most viewed and liked interview so far. And it will more than likely become the biggest liked video. Thank you yeah, guys so much. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I used to write for UFO Magazine for, for um, from 2000 to 2004, and I used to cover all the MUFON meetings in L.A. for the magazine. And I would, and it'd be awesome to go to one in person. It'd be very, just, it'd be very hard not to distract the fact that I'm in the caldera of, <laughs> I'm like... Don't go, okay, I can't, I can't. I, just enjoy it, just I, enjoy it. I know, just enjoy it. I can't let my rideology come out of me. I can't like, I can't, I'm like, I, I, I know I have all my tools with me. I could go to the Home Depot, grab all my geo, geology tools and go right to work. But I've got MUFON stuff to do. So ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out MUFON. 
Join up today. Find your local chapter. You should check out MUFON Social Network. They have their own Facebook, essentially. It's a MUFON Social Network. They also check out their, UF, their brand new movie, Accidental Truth. And the MUFON UFO Sightings Map app, which got a Techno Warriors Editor's Choice. So a big shout out to everyone at MUFON. A big shout out to all our fans who followed us this far. Big shout out to Christopher Nohar and Gwendolyn Allen, our sponsors from Already Coffee Teas and Bobas with over with the Techno Warriors TV Boba. And check this out. I'm gonna work with them to make the MUFON Boba. That's right. <laughs> Just like we did with CES, and we hopefully can attend CES next year. We are gonna do a MUFON boba just for MUFON. And I will probably do a PC version in PC Building Simulator. I know I'm talking a lot, but I'm super excited. This is a historic moment. This is our very first actress we've had on the show. This is big. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have more Hollywood actors on our show. So make sure you stay tuned and make sure to subscribe to Techno Warriors TV or an alien will come abduct you. Have an amazing day. Thank you. And...